So welcome everybody to episode three of this three-part series on what are called non-CO2, short-lived or even super pollutants, uh, which are causing a lot of harm to our world and to our people. We're talking about substances such as soot or black carbon, which comes out of, say, diesel engines. We're talking about low-level ozone, which is called smog by most people. Uh, and we're also talking about methane. We're talking about chemicals used in refrigerants. They all contribute to uh, climate change uh, in all kinds of uh, different but powerful ways. And also they have big implications for human health, but also for crops uh, and also for our natural system. So managing them down, managing them out would be a jolly good idea. Uh, in the first episode, we looked at what these pollutants are. In the second episode, we looked at government policy as being indispensable for the, the kind of actions we need to take. And today, we're going to have a look at mobilizing finance. Um, to set the scene on this topic, I have with me uh, Sean Maguire. He's uh, the strategic partnerships and communications director at the Clean Air Fund. Sean, um, firstly, welcome. Um, and um, can you give us your perspective uh, on how finance might or might not be flowing uh, to phase down uh, even the dream of one day phasing out uh, uh, these uh, super pollutants from our world? Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, it, uh, generally speaking, the financing is not adequate to the urgency of the issue. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you introduced, we're talking here about what we call short-lived climate pollutants. And these are pollutants that have a real near-term impact. Mm -hmm. And whilst it's very, very important that we decarbonize, we cut CO2, and there's a lot of focus and attention on that, that's going to have an impact further out, longer term. Short-lived climate pollutants really have a very intense impact now. Mm -hmm. So it's estimated that, you know, that short-lived climate pollutants are responsible for up to about 50% of near-term global warming. Mm -hmm. So we have both a threat and an opportunity here. If we can address the short-lived climate pollutants, we can, we can buy ourselves some time to get on with the major decarbonization work that we want to do. Mm -hmm. So um, unfortunately, people haven't quite cottoned onto this in the finance world, and the money is not flowing yet. There are one or two sort of beginnings of an exception. So for instance, around methane, um, there's, um, you know, at, at COP28, there was a big funding pledge, a billion dollars uh, pledged for, for, work, for work on methane, which is great, it's a start. Mm -hmm. It's not enough even on methane. But uh, for other short-lived climate pollutants like black carbon, like ozone, uh, the HFCs that you mentioned, there isn't much money uh, flowing. Just to give you an illustration and an example, uh, we estimate at the Clean Air Fund that, that less than 1% of all overseas development assistance over the last year has gone to combating air pollution. So, and you know, all of these SLP, SLCPs are air pollutants. So that's 1% of, mm -hmm. of all that money that's spent on, on development is going towards air pollution. So, so it really is a very minimal amount of money and, it, and, that's, and financing action is a real challenge. Mm. And I mean, I, I echo to that a little bit because I was sitting in this conference room earlier when people were discussing some of these aspects and I saw, I hope I get the numbers right, but they're roughly right. I saw that somebody from the World Bank was saying, just to put sort of mini renewable energy grids in, I think it was 20, African countries uh, in certain areas would cost, you know, 16 billion. And you mentioned uh, this number right now for something that's perhaps even even larger, right? Because mm -hmm. it's global. Um, so interesting. So that's where we are right now. And um, do you think that uh, over the next uh, coming years that we might see some sense of people understanding that these quick wins are genuine and that they also at the same time require that financing. Are you hearing anything uh, in the corridors, as they used to say in conferences? Uh? Well, I mean, I think the bigger picture around this is there's a lot of attention to the, to the question of finance. And uh, COP29, which will be taking place in Azerbaijan later this year, um, is supposed to be the financing COP. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, you know, we know the history of negotiations on COP in recent years have all been about how little money there is going in. Mm -hmm. And there's a real sort of um, challenge uh, for the developed world to fund the actions that need to take place mm -hmm. in the developing world. More specifically, I think um, some of the multilateral banks are beginning to wake up to this mm -hmm. as a challenge um, and are beginning to look at decarbonization as an absolute priority for, the, for their lending operations. But I think you know, there's a further piece of awareness raising that needs to take place mm -hmm. with those financer, mm -hmm. financers around short-lived cli climate mm -hmm. pollutants and realizing that that's actually 
an essential part of the, the climate finance picture. Mm -hmm. And they need to be investing there because that's what's going to, to uh, deliver um, real dividends in the, in, in the short term. Okay. And, and is a sensible investment. Okay, so we might be able to dig into that a little bit, a bit more in a few minutes. But uh, let me now welcome our other uh, wonderful guests. Uh, I have them in no particular order, but I'll have them the way they're written down. I got Orlando uh, Cabrera Rivera. It almost sounds poetic, doesn't it? It sounds like it could it be is. the beginnings it of is. a pop song. Um, <laughs> he's head of unit environmental quality at the Commission for Environmental Cooperation of North America. So welcome, very nice to see you. Uh, we have Malik uh, uh, Hedara. Yes. Yep, great. Senior climate and land advisor at USAID, uh, based in Africa? Uh, in Washington, DC. You're based in Washington? Yes. All right, great. And then we've got uh, Asma uh, Jibral or Jibril, who is Assistant Director at the National Council on Climate Change Nigeria. Do we have him here? No, we don't. Okay, that's fine. We've got Mohamed Sultan, the Regional Lead uh, for Africa at the Global Methane Hub. Phew, you're here. That's super. <laughs> and uh, we also uh, delighted to have uh, Sheila Agrawal Khan, who is, I think, the Director now of the Division of Technology, Industry and Economics. Have I got that right? No. <laughs> no, then you tell me what your title is. Um, Industry and Economy Division at the UN Environment Program. Okay, I, the UN system always is, is more complex. <laughs> okay, great to see you here. Okay, so fantastic to have you. Um, maybe I can turn pretty randomly here to, um, to, to Malik. Uh, funding. Um, is the funding happening for these short-lived climate pollutants? Uh, I mean, Sean says, you know, clearly not, not enough uh, is happening on this. The question might be why, or is it being hidden under the more general title climate change? Or, I mean, it's probably quite hard to follow the money on this, right? Yeah. That is correct. Um, thanks, Nick. And like, like um, Sean mentioned earlier, funding for short-lived climate pollutant is very, is very lacking. And, but I think we, uh, we did pretty much achieve some quite interesting achievement during the COP28, mm -hmm. where um, um, governments and, uh, and uh, have announced nearly one, over $1, one billion dollars in funding since COP27. As you mm -hmm. may recall, when we went to uh, COP27, we have, there was a little announcement around finance for methane particularly, right? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. now at COP28, we're talking about one billion from government, from bilateral aid agencies, mm -hmm. and in addition to nearly um, $3.5 billion that are actually being pledged by uh, international financial institution. Mm -hmm. um, that is actually a, a, a phenomenal um, um, progress in, in one year, I think. Um, um, and we actually hope to, uh, to see similar um, uh, improvement again, um, you know, with the years to come. But I think we have actually reached that, um, that achievement as a result of a lot of engagement, a lot of awareness raising that are actually being done. Uh, as you may all recall, um, President Biden uh, launched the uh, Methane Finance Sprint. Uh, during the, um, um, the June 2023 major economic forum. That, uh, that was pretty much followed by a lot of uh, diplomatic engagement with other bilateral aid agencies, mm -hmm. and which helped us to actually get to that uh, level of uh, funding um, uh, now. And uh, the work is not done. There's much more to be done, mm -hmm. as, you, uh, as you may already know. I mean, from a study that uh, were released uh, in 2022, only 2% 2 of climate finance um, uh, is actually attributed to uh, methane um, projects. And mm -hmm. uh, that, in order to actually um, reach the, uh, the goal that we want to reach in terms of methane um, mitigation, that level of funding needs to actually be increased by at least tenfold. Mm. And there is mm. a lot more work that needs to be done in order to, ask yeah. to get there. And is it methane funding uh, or methane funding for uh, uh, tackling the oil and gas industry with their leaks, or is it for waste tips and their leaks? And the majority of that funding for methane is it? Where is it? Is it going into certain kinds of projects that that, that remove or mitigate uh, methane? Um, some of that funding is actually going to in the uh, um, um, fossil fuel sector as well as in the waste sector, but the majority is actually going to the, uh, to the waste sector. I think right. uh, we have about two thirds of the methane funding going to the waste sector. Right, 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 got you. Okay. Um, maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about uh, the sector and the, re sorry, the region that you're from. Um, are people, are the countries there aware uh, of these, these short-lived climate pollutants? Uh, are they 
starting to step up a bit with the finance. What's your perspective? Oh, yeah, um, well, let me put it in perspective too. Yeah. We are part of a, an agreement on the yeah. environment between Canada, the US and Mexico. Yes. And we are part of a trade agreement as well. And we have been doing a lot of work for the last 15 years actually on addressing uh, climate pollutants, but recently focusing on short-lived climate pollutants. We have uh, right now a f a focused on uh, reducing uh, methane from the waste sector. Mm -hmm. We also have uh, a done a lot of work in improving the uh, estimates of the emissions of black carbon. So uh, because we're doing this collaboratively amongst the three countries, we need to ensure that the information that we get is comparable and compatible amongst the three countries mm -hmm. in order to do a coordinated effort to reducing those emissions. So uh, the three governments put money for a number of projects and initiatives mm -hmm. to address uh, the reduction of emissions of those short-lived climate pollutants. Apart from that, um, we have two grant programs, environmental justice mm -hmm. for climate and also the North American Partnership for Community Action. These are grant programs for community level actions on climate change adaptation and mitigation, mm -hmm. and also addressing the impacts of uh, some of those short lived climate pollutants. Okay, okay. What's your perspective? Uh, and and where, where, do you, where do you come into this great big jig, jigsaw puzzle of <laughs> this massive topic? Yeah, thank you so much. And it's great to be, uh, to be here with all of you. It's a, it's a really critical question. I work with the Global Methane Hub, which is sort of, yeah, and uh, a concrete example of how the world is starting to recognize that we need to act uh, more boldly, more rapidly, with more intent uh, to address uh, methane in particular within the broader climate space where uh, a pooled fund of philanthropic um, actors. The, a few things that, that were said are really, really important to set the stage. One is obviously that the funding is not adequate. Uh, and it's not only adequate because there's not enough money. We fund every year a report that looks at the state of methane abatement finance globally. And 2% uh, of climate finance goes to methane. But that is also probably not directed necessarily where it could be the most impactful. It is also not adequately distributed geographically. Um, and it also probably uh, needs to at least triple by 2030. There's, there's been improvements about 20% of, of, of method finance in the past few years, but it needs to triple to get to probably around $50 billion a year just to address these three, these three major sectors. Um, but it is also the case that the, the way we think about what constitutes methane finance is also not as clear as we would like it to be, so it's hard to track. And so getting a better taxonomy, which is the way in which we define what our actual methane abatement and mitigation tools, what are enabling conditions, uh, which sectors is also difficult. So there's an underlying structural point that mm -hmm. we need to uh, um, improve so that we can get to the real question of how we move money in an adequate, stable way to the right places mm -hmm. for the greater impact. We can go into a bit, a, a bit more detail, but as you said, Nick, uh, it's not necessarily that there is not enough money. In fact, even without thinking, we need new money. Mm -hmm. Right, but that's absolutely clear. But even the way money is utilized now could be vastly improved. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you think about, for example, the existing set of resources that are going into waste management, uh, particularly through multilateral development banks, a few of them up to a few years ago were thinking about the methane impact of investing in incineration and landfilling. Today, we've got partnerships with the Inter-American Development Bank, we've got great collaborations with the World Bank, we're talking to the African Development Bank about ways in which they can front load a better understanding of the methane impact of their own loans and investments with countries in ways that are able to reduce long-term uh, methane impact and in line with the developmental objectives that their boards and their constituencies mm -hmm. are looking for. So I think there's, uh, there's also this question of matching money with the projects. We work a lot in trying to make sure that we are supporting countries who in reality are often overwhelmed with all of the different demands to make sure that they're preparing the right types of projects for the right type of financial vehicle. 
um, it's very different to be applying for grant money, which is a very tiny part of methane mm -hmm. finance, than it is to be applying for corporate re corporate money or equity or debt. And so, and there is that need to make sure that the the, the project preparation uh, meets the where the money is, uh, and mm -hmm. it is very different types of projects that you have, whether you're talking about uh, uh, the waste sector or the energy sector that you mentioned, or even agriculture, mm -hmm. where the demand in research and development, for example, is quite acute. Yeah. Um, so. Okay, Mohamed, that was, that was quite comprehensive. Thank you. Um, so, Sheila, um, we have these regional development banks, we have the World Bank, we have the Global Environment Facility, the Green Climate Fund, many of these you know, multilateral sort of bodies that have money in their vaults. Uh, and they need to spend it wisely, of course, because they have a lot of people making sure that they do that. Um, is this, from your perspective, one of the areas of finance that could step up a little bit more to the short-lived climate pollutants uh, in, in some shape or form, whether it be de-risking investments, whether it be directly investing, what, what's, what's your thoughts about yeah, this? Yeah, I, th I think there's a, let's say, a very big space that has not been occupied yet for the short-lived climate pollutants. And that's primarily because, well, let's just take the Climate and Clean Air Coalition, a coalition that UNEP provides the secretariat for. It has set a nice enabling environment for, the, let's say, the foundational work, inventories of short-lived climate pollutants. They're even up to the level of a policy that a country might have put in place, an action plan. But now, how do you get that to move to implementation? How do you get investment coming in from, mm. say, the regional development banks or other financiers? Well, the challenge is, is that you need to have deals that at the end of the day, these banks would be willing to fund. So there's a, you could call it a missing middle where you have a plan, you have a strategy, a policy, but actually you don't have the deals. Mm -hmm. And so these banks are looking for the deals. And so there's a need to step in with the financing to be able to help entities structure deals. So how mm. do you have something that'll generate a rate of return that will pull in the financiers and the investment players mm. into the space? Mm. That's a very interesting point that you make. And, and maybe you can dive a bit, bit into this because, I mean, it seems to be wherever you look, whether you look at sort of normal climate finance or whether you could say this, I mean, this isn't specialized climate finance, but it's, it's got some particular targets, right? That particularly in the developing countries, there's always this problem, is there not? That, that, that either the loan's got a high interest rate, which nobody can pay back, or the country itself is so in debt to somebody else that it can't possibly dream of even getting the cash. Um, so there's all these kinds of hurdles that have to be leaped to actually, and we don't have time, do we? I mean, we've got 2030 to halve emissions uh, to have a 50-50 chance uh, of, of a 1.5 degree centigrade target not uh, withering and dying. Um, can maybe I can just ask that question before because I was just intrigued by this Atlantic article, which was saying that you know there needs to be guarantees so that the private sector uh, can actually you know pile in because the private sector it seems to one uh, all around the world there's a load of money out there sitting around in in banks and pension funds not knowing quite where to invest right. And it could be deployed, these trillions and trillions and trillions, into something quite useful, but it has to be an investment grade investment. Mm -hmm. So the Atlantic article was saying that if you have a $500 billion fund and you analyze the risk of those investments is about 10% failure, you need uh, about 50 billion to guarantee so that the investors then pile in and go, okay, it's worth doing this, right? Do, do these come up often now these days, the concept of guarantees? And are they working? Does anybody know? Um, or is it a new idea? No, it's definitely not a new idea. Yeah. Um, USAID has been involved um, in guarantees uh, for, for quite a while. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, with the, um, the creation of uh, the US uh, uh, Development Finance Cooperation uh, a few years ago, uh, that is actually the uh, US government aid entity that is in charge of uh, providing uh, guarantees, particularly to support development um, projects. Um, at a time when USAID was actually uh, taking the lead on that, uh, we have actually provided uh, guarantees um, in for to actually uh, support many projects around the world. Often it's like 50% guarantee that we mm. provide, and uh, um, it's pretty much a, a an agreement with um, a local banks and trying to actually incentivize the banks to provide loans 
uh, mm -hmm. to uh, the private sector and uh, other players to uh, support projects, and we will actually um, pay you know 50% uh, of any potential default, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That may result from uh, the provision of that guarantee. Mm -hmm. And we did actually achieve um, a lot of result, which I don't receive, uh, have uh, the detail here right now. But mm -hmm. uh, it is something that we are still continuing to doing in the recurrent DFC um, um, agency right now. Mm -hmm. Are there, are there some areas of, of this story that, that we shouldn't be relying on the international system to, to handle? I'm thinking about leaks from the oil and gas industry, right? I mean, these are, in many cases, wealthy companies making huge profits. Isn't that just simply a question of policy where governments simply say, do it? Right. Um. So there is, there, there is a real place for regulation yeah. um, mm -hmm. uh, within, within, within the system to incentivize uh, companies to take the right steps. Um, and you know the private sector. The private sector really has a strong role to play. We know that there's nothing like the amount of finance required to decarbonize and get rid of short-lived climate pollutants going to come from from state and international lending. We absolutely mm -hmm. need the private sector. Mm -hmm. So you need a blend of incentives and kind of kind of regulation that that um, allows companies the security to invest, mm -hmm. but also to know that they will bear costs if they do not operate in a, in, in, in a clean and sustainable way. Mm. Um, and there are not many countries have really got that right yet. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, a, that's, you know, it's, I don't know whether it's low hanging fruit, but it's fruit that needs to be plucked. Right. And I think in addition to the policy and regulatory uh, environment that governments have to create, it's also, so UNEP supports what's called the Independent Methane Emissions Observatory. Mm -hmm. It identifies leaks through satellite data of coming from different countries. Mm -hmm. And it comes back to the oil companies to say, hey, you have a big methane leak here. Mm -hmm. You know, it needs to be plugged. So the environment is set there for the action. Mm -hmm. The challenge is, is maybe it's not happening at the pace that's needed. If I can maybe come back to the question on, say, for example, USAID saying, OK, we give out guarantees. Imagine for HFCs, which is another short-lived climate pollutant, and you have cooling happening. So you can, if governments were to put in place the policies and laws and regulations to set standards for what is non-HFC, energy efficient cooling, mm -hmm. then businesses have to respond. Mm -hmm. Now, if businesses have the kind of guarantees that we're hearing mm -hmm. about, then they will probably shift mm -hmm. to being able to, because they got a market signal, they have a mm -hmm. risk of being brought down. And so there is here a chance for a whole different type of mm. cooling so that you don't have very low efficiency mm -hmm. HFC cooling equipment mm. coming in, especially into the developing world where you can have a lot of dumping mm. of old obsolete equipment. So it's a good point, isn't it? Because I mean, one of these short-lived climate pollutants is soot, and that comes from diesel cars. And, and the, I know other sources are burning, but you know, so the setting standards on the internal combustion engine or getting rid of the internal combustion engine, the electrification of transportation in Europe and, uh, but also increasingly in places. I mean, in Nairobi, they're now running electric buses because they've got so much re renewable energy, which is fantastic. I mean, this is where regulation or government setting a clear path to a future that we need, um, then the money follows from the private sector. They invest in the, the, the charging points, um, maybe public private partnerships for that as well. But the direction is clear where things need to go and things happen and the soot will go down as well because of that, plus obviously other kinds of emissions. Uh, yeah, but I think though, um, in yeah. addition to the guarantee... No, no, you can go first, he's gonna go second. Yeah, in addition <laughs> to the guarantee and uh, the uh, regulatory framework put to through the sort of uh, incentivize investment, um, they think we, another challenge here is the identification of uh, bankable projects, particularly mm -hmm. when it comes to mitigation of uh, short-lived climate pollutant um, you want to make sure, if, when the private sector, let's take the example of uh, a methane. And if you have a private business interested in invested um, in, let's say, incineration, for example, of, uh, of, uh, of waste mm -hmm. to generate energy. And, and, but you want to make sure that that investment is actually viable, is bankable. And in many development countries, um, there is not solid evidence, uh, uh, solid um, uh, history of uh, you know, bankability of this mm -hmm. type of project. I think mm -hmm. it is very important that despite the fact that there may be 
um, you know, our guarantees here, and uh, there may be some interest from um, the private sector, there may be some regulatory framework. The critical part here is the, uh, the uh, um, development of bankable project. And, but I think that will also uh, rely a lot on availability of data as well, right? Mm. For instance, in the case of incineration, you need a consistent supply of waste for example, to operate those um, incinerators and uh, how the city will be able to make sure that the operator will have the volume of waste that it needs on a daily basis mm -hmm. for the foreseeable future. Mm -hmm. All of these things are that thing that the private sector is taking into account mm -hmm. in, in order to come up with uh, mm -hmm. projects. Mm -hmm. Well, picking up on that, and what I mean, so for just so push your voice a bit as well. <clears throat> just push your voice. So I all know right. we're all a bit hoarse from these yeah, meetings. Yeah, just picking but... up on, on the waste generation, and also on what uh, uh, Mohammed mentioned before yeah. in terms of the right partnership to make the financing go longer. I think mm -hmm. private sector engagement is key to that. And as an example, for example, we had a partnership with uh, fruit processing companies and restaurant chains on a food loss and waste quantification a program for North America. Basically, uh, bringing the private sector together to better quantify the food loss and waste that they were generating, making their operations more efficient, and then that way reducing the waste that could become methane in the long run. Mm -hmm. So just wanted to... Yeah, yeah, bring that one in. Yeah, and also you mentioned data as well. So Mohammed, you want to say something? Yeah, no, I mean, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of great points. And I think it's, um, as everyone said, you know, uh, you, there's a, a lot of underlying things that need to sort of improve in order to make mm -hmm. sure that the money goes where it is most impactful in terms of the climate impact. But where also, is it most impactful? I think that was, you raised well, that before. Yeah, in the, well, in the methane, in the, in the methane space, um, oil and gas, and then the fossil fuel sector right. uh, is, is where tremendous amounts of emissions are coming from. And then the the food sector, uh, obviously, in, in the agricultural landscape, we look a lot um, mm -hmm. to uh, sort of livestock and, and, and rest production. Right. But definitely, there's a huge potential to, to abate methane in, in the oil and gas sector mm. uh, and in the coal, coal, mine, um, coal mining as well. But, um, uh, but it is also the case that, uh, yes, obviously, better data is absolutely, is absolutely needed. When we speak about regulations, there's a uh, a, a big move uh, recently to think about trade-related measures, uh, particularly in the fossil fuel industry, obviously because this stuff moves a lot, uh, to set um, benchmarks uh, for emission standards uh, for uh, the import of fossil fuel. Europe is uh, is going that way. The, the, the U.S. is going that way. There's conversations uh, gl globally around ways that we can make sure that we are clear on what constitutes a mm -hmm. bare minimum. Uh, but in that, it's always going to come down to the implementation, the application, the applicability, and cooperation. We think a lot about this at the, at the hub, um, that there is the sharing of information, the sort of the partnerships that are required, both within the multilateral uh, system, uh, which uh, is, is great, and, but is also very slow moving in, mm -hmm. in, in many ways, is absolutely gonna be critical to make sure that if you're a country that is looking for funding, it doesn't take you three, five years to get it. It doesn't mean that you have to apply for 15, to go through 15 different processes for similar type of projects. I think we've got to simplify it uh, to the maximum for countries that have either bankable projects or that have regulations in place to make sure that they can, that they can access it at a fair if it is debt. And sometimes it doesn't, it cannot yeah. be debt. Uh, also an adequate. And you mentioned earlier on that, of course, there's major changes in the, in, in the sort of the architecture, the financing architecture, and that it may take too long, uh, but I think we still need to continue, particularly for the developing world, to mm. make sure that we are pushing for better conditions for de the developing world to be able to access those resources. And we cannot decouple the two. Of course, we've got to move fast, but it has to be consistent. It has to be clear. What about carbon credits? Because we had um, this chap, Derry, uh, who is a co-chair, I think, of the Climate and Clean mm -hmm. Air Coalition from Ghana, on yesterday talking about government policy. Yep. And he touched on the fact that they've got a lot of government policy now in Ghana yes. to deal with these. And so I said, well, what about finance? Because you, know, you have you know, policies dripping out of your socks, right? But if you haven't got any money, you can't do anything about it. And uh, he said um, that they were you know, trying to do the carbon credit route. But then, you know, everyone got excited about carbon credits after the COP in Glasgow, COP26, the UN Climate Conference in Glasgow, and it was all going to boom big time, but it seems to have kind of stopped booming, <laughs> if I can put it that way. 
and sort of settle down again to some levels that were a little bit higher than the past, but not as high as people want. Is, is this avenue blocked at the moment a bit, the carbon credit avenue? Maybe because of negative publicity by some NGOs that don't like the use of certain credits in certain places, or well, is this, yeah? Well, there's been greenwashing, which has, of yep. course, hampered the whole environment for it. So there's a need for proper methodologies to be able mm -hmm. to really make sure that what you're getting credit for is mm -hmm. really valid and credible, mm -hmm. legitimate. So there is a whole process to try to move that space mm -hmm. in that direction. Mm -hmm. But yeah, there is, of course, the opportunity to use carbon credits. Mm -hmm. It's just making sure that it, it doesn't get, it, it, there's not a risk of greenwashing in the mm -hmm. process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the other challenge around carbon credits as well is the measurement aspect of it. How are you, uh, how we, uh, will we be able to actually measure the actual mitigation achieved in order for the payment to kick in, Yeah. right? So in particular for some sectors, it's really difficult to measure in the rice sector for methane emission or, or the livestock sector as well, it's very difficult to actually measure the actual mm -hmm. um, emission mitigation. So that often mm -hmm. uh, make it a little bit challenging for the carbon um, market to actually be uh, effective. So what I'm, what I'm hearing basically is kind of, I mean, Sheila knows I worked for the UN for many years and this notion of there are not enough bankable projects, we're not moving the finance, there's, we have not, not got enough measurements, we haven't got this, we haven't got that. And I'm thinking, holy shit, you know, it's 2024 right now and we've got six years to halve global emissions. And I think according to the International Energy Agency or somebody else that we've got only a third of that halving possibly done by 2030. So we've got two thirds to do between to halve emissions by 2030. Um, are you all living in absolute terror that we're not gonna actually, you know, sh sort out these short-lived climate pollutants? Um, or what can the next COP in Azerbaijan, and perhaps just as importantly, or more importantly, the COP in Brazil do to fast forward climate action on CO2, but also on these short-lived climate pollutants? Um, anybody got any ideas of what they wanna well, I mean, scream I, I, for in uh, well, these COPs? I, I think first, <laughs> first of all, I think um, the COPs have necessarily been very focused on CO2. Mm -hmm. um, in the last couple of years, we've seen the COPs focus also on methane. Um, and in the last COP, um, there was language inserted around um, looking for action on all non-CO2 pollutants. Mm -hmm. Now we need to see we need to see much more concrete um, action behind that, behind behind the non-CO2 pollutants. We need mm -hmm. to see flesh there, and we need to see mm -hmm. we need to see programming. We need to see finance come in there. So I think the, the diplomats and the countries are beginning to wake up to the fact that uh, short-lived climate pollutants are a huge challenge, but also an opportunity for action. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what I would like to see um, uh, begin to happen in, in, in Azerbaijan. And one way that you can get into that is, um, I work for the Clean Air Fund, we're very focused on air pollution. You can, air, you know, going for air pollution gives you health benefits and it gives you, it gives you, you know, you can get it black carbon, you can get it ozone as well, which mm -hmm. are other short-lived climate pollutants. Mm -hmm. So bringing air pollution into the story um, in the COPs, uh, beginning to talk more about climate and health um, is, another, is another area where we could see international action uh, progress faster. Right, right. I would say that, you know, because as you say, we're, we're saying on the one hand, we want bankable deals, and on the other hand, we're, we're well, we don't have them, basically. And so instead of miraculously thinking they'll just appear, I think the seed funding to be able to take some of the work on policy strategies and say, okay, now what, what are the potential deals that mm. can come and how can these be seeded? So you have a, let's say this missing middle starts to get become an engine mm -hmm. rather than waiting for the deals to happen. Because right now we have one group, which is the regional development banks looking for the deals and other financiers. We have another group looking at the policy regulatory mm -hmm. side, the data side. And there's this big gap that is mm -hmm. just not being addressed and it needs money to be put onto it, it at a ground level to be able to say, actually, let's move this into a more scaled up action. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we're, like you say, it's a very long journey to go from inventories to planning to strategies and then to get to actual scaled mm -hmm. up investment action. 
Is it because that the, the finance community writ large is, is uh, on one level highly risk averse these days and very cautious? And yet we've got this other thing out there, which is clear from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, that we've got a hell of a bigger risk out there right now called climate change and public health and, and many other things. There has to be that we've got to take a bet on the future, haven't we? I, I, maybe I shouldn't use the word bet, but you know, it's not a poker game, but we've got to take a bet on the future and take some risks, haven't we? Yeah, I think that's that, that's really right. And maybe to, to put a positive a positive spin on this, um, we've really been thinking about what you've been what you've been describing, sort of that gap, right? And so, for us, it's really taking up taking advantage of the spotlight being being shone on um, on method in particular, and trying to move that. So, in Asia, we're working directly with cities and uh, and governments to build projects and pipelines, bankable projects, putting in grant money to make sure that cities and, and, and companies are able to build up their pipeline and potentially get to, get to financing. This is grant money mm -hmm. that's used directly to make sure that it is scaled. We uh, are working with the Inter American Development Bank, uh, putting a, a grant resource with them. They have a $500 million waste uh, portfolio that can be moved to really think about addressing methane in the waste sector. We are in close conversations with uh, the African Development Bank, same thing. And the, and the reality is we want to see the money being applied in ways that are meeting developmental and climate goals as their mandate as their mandate is, and really fill that gap. And this is where I think philanthropy can come play a particularly interesting role. Uh, because as you said, the private sector may not be the first mover in many, many occasions, mm. many, many occasions, although they need to be. And so uh, philanthropy can play that role and it cannot fill that void. You cannot feel that void alone. Yep. The one thing I want to add, I, uh, uh, Mohammed really made a really good point. I think public funding would be very critical to actually so, show some proof of concept, mm -hmm. right? Um, fund some projects that are perhaps innovative and uh, achieving some result, and that could eventually inform, you know, the development of a bankable project that can uh, perhaps uh, incentivize the private sector to actually step in. So initial mm -hmm. funding from a private sector, I mean, from a public sector is really critical. That's one reason why USAID is actually taking um, um, steps to what I call usually metanize our portfolio, whatever there is opportunities, mm -hmm. trying to actually um, further elevate the methane mitigation uh, opportunities that we have in all, our, all of our dairy productivity um, project, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, solid waste management project, as well as energy project as well. So we can come up with a mm -hmm. lot of good example of a uh, of, of, of project that can be funded. Mm -hmm. What about, I um, just want to get back to the private sector again. I mean, we have uh, large numbers of companies now that have set science-based targets. They're supposed to decarbonize their products and their operations, and then they're supposed to go all the way down their supply chains and get rid of uh, pollution. Uh, decarbonize those as well, working with uh, yeah, supply chains that go around the world. So are non-CO2 short-lived super pollutants in science-based targets? Do they or not? And if they aren't, shouldn't they be there? And then the private sector would if they want to achieve their climate targets under the uh, science-based targets initiative, some, for, for example, they would have to work with their partners and companies down the supply chain to tackle those things. I, I don't know the answer. If you don't know the answer, it's not a problem. But it's something that we put out to the audience, maybe, to, to, to reflect on, because I would have thought that was an opportunity that might be a missed opportunity if it's not. Um... Yeah, we, we've done some work to look at the various kind of um, reporting regimes out there, mm -hmm. um, and particularly from the perspective of air pollution and air pollutants. Um, and we are not really finding any mention in those reporting regimes of, mm -hmm. of air pollutants. They're very focused on greenhouse gases. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so we've got an effort to try to work with companies, multinational companies, to get them to uh, report on, on, measure and report, and ultimately reduce their air pollutants along their value chains in parallel with doing their greenhouse gas uh, mm -hmm. uh, measuring, reporting, and, re mm -hmm. and reduction. So that's a thing called the Alliance for Clean Air, and that's you know beginning to companies are beginning to report, but it's and it's an initial an initial step 
but mm -hmm. the, but ultimately the vast majority of private enterprise out there mm -hmm. is suffering the ill effects of air pollution and shortly mm -hmm. climate pollutants but not realizing they have a role in combating it so mm -hmm. you know air pollution will send your workers home sick um, they have to take time off to look after sick kids mm -hmm. um, you know so absenteeism and lower productivity mm -hmm. and yet at the same time um, they can take action within their supply chains and their, their means mm -hmm. of production to to contribute to a cleaner world, mm. and that's and they're and they're they're not voluntarily doing so yet, apart from a few exceptional front runners. Mm -hmm. Well, on, on that as well, and also what you mentioned before in terms of the messaging of the next COP and all that, you mentioned you know uh, at COP twenty eight we held where there was a link made with health, yeah. and we don't talk about the you know, the cost, yeah. monetized mm -hmm. cost of health impacts mm -hmm. of the pollutants. I think that has to come to the forefront in order to make uh, action. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got to have the full economics of all these things so that we know what we're doing to ourselves and make better choices. That's absolutely clear. Um, just looking then at some of these, these wider... I mean, I have to mention fossil fuel subsidies. Do we all think they should be phased down and spent on getting rid of methane and black carbon and other things like that? Why, why do you think, I mean, they're up, again, I see, uh, I see they're now one point, is it three trillion direct? Uh, was it, is it 1.3, am I right? Trillion, they were, bi they were 900 billion, weren't they, uh, a couple of years ago? They seem to be higher now. I think the key is to get to repurpose the subsidies mm. so that at the end of the day, at the worker level, you're not paying the price of mm -hmm. it. And, you know, it needs to be a just transition mm -hmm. where if you're a coal miner, you're a worker at low income level, and you can have the subsidy repurposed in a way that can help fuel the clean energy transition, but at the same time, make sure that workers' jobs are still secure in a different way, mm -hmm. maybe even in a in a safer and better way mm -hmm. and more stable way than what they have today. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. No, no, I mean, and the figures are extraordinary. Um, the the, the 1.3 trillion is from the IMF. Um, yeah. So there's a huge opportunity there. But as Sheila said, the, the, um, there's a reluctance um, from, from governments to, to destabilize the status quo. Yeah. And there will be vested interests in the way economies are, are currently run. So there's, um, there's a little bit more political courage needed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some good examples out there of where countries have already started to repurpose um, uh, subsidies away from things like kerosene, uh, which is a sort of lighting fuel, which mm -hmm. is absolutely horrible uh, for health and is full of black carbon. Um, and they've, um, they've redirected subsidies away from, from, from kerosene towards um, transition fuel such as gas or ultimately on to renewable mm -hmm. energy mm -hmm. um, electricity mm -hmm. so there are models out there that can be learned from right good well we can't solve all the problems this afternoon this evening or wherever you are in the world uh, but we are trying to reveal in a sense this area of the short-lived climate pollutants these super pollutants and the fact that they they need uh, some special attention whether it be on policy whether it be on finance uh, or whether it won't be on, on the public, understanding that they're out there and demanding of their politicians' action. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for uh, being here with uh, the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and We Don't Have Time TV, and uh, look forward to seeing you again in some part of the world, hopefully where it's even cleaner and cleaner every year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you.